This is Duke University. Global trade and environmental Being justice. Human rights China issues today. are still. The term Ubuntu. A alien and sedition accident. He's making inferential discoveries. The importance of an archive. The John Ho Franklin Center. I'm very pleased uh, to introduce the, the dean of the Fuqua School of Business here uh, at Duke University, who has provided this lovely facility for our session this morning and for our lunch today. Uh, Dr. Blair Shepard will say a few words, and he will, in turn, introduce our keynote speaker. So um, I know everyone has said uh, thank you to many, many people. I'd just like to say thanks, just in case you haven't been thanked, uh, Stephen, for the tireless work you did getting all this to happen. If it hadn't been for your energies, we wouldn't be talking about energy today. Um, so thank you. Um, I'm thrilled to actually be able to introduce our speaker um, and welcome you here for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, let me list three. The first is that um, we as a university have made a pretty serious bet on energy and environment as a significant issue that we should be at the middle of. Um, the logic to that, I think, is actually fairly important because it relates to some of the theme of this conference. The, the inherent logic is, if we are going to deal with the simultaneous issues associated with energy, related to economics of it, related to behavior change associated with related to technology change, related to how you manage, in a sense, some paradoxes um, built into the question, it actually is a multidisciplinary, I would argue, multi-scholastic problem, meaning it's the kind of problem that sits at the intersection of all the schools in this university. There's a little bit of basic science to it, there's a little bit of engineering to it, there's a little bit of public policy to it, there's a little bit of law to it, there's a little bit of business to it, a little bit of, uh, of medicine to it. And so if we're going to actually tackle um, sort of questions of affordability, security, and, uh, and, and environment as, as things you do together, um, you actually need to be able to do it as a whole university. And our belief is that we actually are better positioned than any other university to do that because even though we're imperfect at having the parts work together, we're better than the alternatives. There's a bunch of assets we have. So one of them is being in the southeast, we don't seem to have an obvious point of view. If we were in Texas, it would be clear what our point of view would be. If we were on the west coast, it would be clear what our point of view would be. If we are in the northeast, it would be clear what our point of view would be. Because we're in the southeast, people think of us as agnostic in some ways. Um, we're close to the policy center, for at least for the United States, so I think this is a global issue, not just an American or Canadian issue, um, but we're close to it. And we're actually building capability near the policy centers in other places in the world. Um, and, and, and so in some ways, we've made a bet, and it's a huge bet that the university is making. Um, all of us have agreed that we're going to hire faculty to it. We've agreed we're going to focus on it seriously. We've agreed we're going to work together um, in a major way. And, and so, I think Canada, U.S. as a crucible for thinking about those issues is about as good a place as you could to start that kind of consideration. And so because we've made a commitment to that set of questions, I'm thrilled you're here. The second is that actually we have in the business school um, and in allied schools in policy in the Nicholas School some amazing students that you're getting a chance to meet. Um, and so I'm thrilled you're here because as a dean, I always have a secondary, there are three, there are two secondary conditions you know a dean's going to bring with them. One of them is, um, where is your checkbook? And the second one is, where are your job opportunities, right? And, um, and so since you're here and you're meeting our students, I assume you're going to go away and say, boy, I'm blown away at how amazing these kids are, right? You better be because I am. Um, now we've made, uh, and I want to talk about two things to that quickly. One is we made a commitment as a business school, which is we started the um, Energy Development and Global Environment Center that Dan is heading up. Um, that is actually built both as a thing to support what we're doing, but also a bridge to the other parts of the university. So it's a bridge to the Nicholas School, it's a bridge to the, um, to the policy, to the Sanford School, it's a bridge to engineering. And we're beginning to see more and more students who are dual degree. So we have some amazing Master's Environmental Management MBA. We have some amazing MPP MBAs um, who actually have energy as their preoccupation. I've been 
astounded at, we announced this, I guess, about a year and a half ago, Dan, a year ago, and the level of excitement about, from people, uh, students, around what we're doing is just astounding. And the quality of the students is amazing. So I'm thrilled you have a chance to see them. Uh, and, and again, I think Canada, US, is a fantastic place to actually take as the starting point for that consideration, and, and, and sort of three quick reasons. First is, there are some phenomenally interesting paradoxes in energy. Let me give you one. I'm sorry, I'm going to pick on you, Rick, but you sat next to me, and so it comes to mind. Um, Rick George was named the environmentalist of the, of the year in the year in which he put more carbon into the Canadian atmosphere than any person in the country. Now, I want to I highlight, that's actually a paradox, because it turns out he deserved the award. He really, really did deserve the award, because the paradoxical problem is the following problem. This world needs energy. This country needs energy. It turns out, if we do not generate more energy, we will not continue to bring people out of poverty, and the world we would live in, if we couldn't continue to bring people out of poverty as a world, I don't want to live in. It's really ugly. Right? The leading countries in the world throughout history have always had the least expensive source of energy. That's what makes them the leading countries in the world. So you've got to create energy. But it's pretty clear that some of the ways in which we're creating energy has some risks associated with them that we also have to figure out how to manage. I don't mean to presume the answer to the questions, but I do mean to presume that asking the questions about risk is really important. So there's some paradoxical issues, and I think actually the choices confronting Canada and the US be they related to shale, be they related to the tar sands, be they related to building a pipeline, whatever the issues are, are issues that are profoundly important and symbolically critical to the whole debate the world's engaged in related to energy. And so I think this is a phenomenal piece, but it's paradoxical, interestingly paradoxical. Second key element is that energy is a global problem but most of the answers find themselves in a given country. And so our ability to actually manage cross-border, and, and to me, it's, it, it is one of the really fundamental dilemmas, which is how we deal with energy will influence the whole world. Take Japan as an illustration, right? But most of the critical regulatory questions sit within Washington or sit within Ottawa or sit within Berlin or sit within Beijing. And so one of the fundamental issues is we actually have to figure out how to get people from disparate countries talking to each other. And if you can't do it between Canada and the U.S., who can you do it between? Right. Um, and the third is, actually, I personally represent that because I think, slightly illegally, I'm a citizen of both countries. Um, <laughs> which is when you declare U.S. citizenship, in theory, you're supposed to give up your Canadian citizenship, but I still have my passport in my desk at home. And, um, and I, I actually believe that the longest undefended border in the world really is itself a symbol for the kinds of relationships we have to build in this world if we're going to deal with the fundamental questions of sustainable energy. Um, and, and therefore, I think this conference and the subject matter of this conference, if, if we can figure out how to get this paired relationship right, we can be a symbol and an exemplar for the whole world. Um, and, and it turns out, personally, I care about both sides of this deal because I have family living in Canada and I have family living in the United States. Um, and and so it matters to me personally. Final point is um, I'm just thrilled at the people we've had come. It, it's actually humbling that you've agreed to come here and speak to us because <laughs> you're amazing people. Um, and, and so thank you for coming as far as you did. Thank you for engaging us and, um, and I hope you are enjoying the facility and enjoying each other's company. Speaking of amazing people, let me introduce our speaker. Right. Um, David Goldwyn has this wonderful sort of combination of capabilities, which is he's a brilliant academic who's written one of the most important books. Um, 
He is a really, really, really good business person who actually understands the business issues associated with energy. And he's a guy who's actually had a lot to say about policy, especially recently, although he's won some battles and lost some others, as he'll say, I suspect. Um, and in a sense, if anyone personifies the complex set of issues associated with what we're trying to do, it's someone who actually has thought about this deeply enough that he actually knows a little more than the rest of us on the subject matter he's an expert on, who has actually taken that expertise and tried to rough it up in policy making at a time when it really, really, really matters, who is also a person who's trying to help all businesses figure out how to manage it because I believe a reason you're here in the business school is that business will be the answer to this problem in the end, right? And because you're the perfect exemplar of the person who is at the center of this, I yield the floor to David Goldman. Thanks, Blair. I don't think I can live up to that introduction, but I will, uh, I will do my best. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here at Duke. As a Georgetown graduate, I'm glad to be facing you in a policy debate and not in the basketball, uh, in the basketball arena, but it's great to be here. And, uh, and my compliments to Duke for taking that interdisciplinary approach to energy because it is about business and policy and engineering and science, and uh, you can't be smart or effective unless you approach it that way. And, uh, and, uh, and, and thanks also to, uh, to all of our hosts um, from, uh, from all of the, all of the schools and, uh, and my compliments to all of our ambassadors, current and former, who are, who are here today. And I have to say it's an edited book that I did on energy and security. And Amy Jaffe, one of the uh, contributors to two chapters, and that one is, is here today, but happy to make a contribution. <clears throat> I want to talk about um, energy security, what it means for the U.S. Uh, so that you can appreciate why Canada matters so much. And uh, I want to talk about also how the ground has shifted tremendously, both in terms of policy and economics, but also in energy resources in the last few years, but significantly in the last six months, and why the path forward, the U.S.-Canada relationship, the future of shale gas, Keystone XL, really depends on striking that balance between energy and environment in the right way because you're not going to take the politics or the economics out of, out of the decision, and you need that, you need that balance. And it's, it's complicated, um, and we're not there yet. Uh, in terms of U.S. energy security, or energy security for any country, it's accessing the supplies that you need to make the economy run. It's not so much about money. It's really about power and survival. You think about the lights going on or off in Ukraine or in Georgia, or you think about Japan, whether they can physically get supply in. We are really blessed in the United States because we have tremendous supplies. We don't have electricity insecurity. We don't have gas insecurity. We have oil price insecurity, not even supply. And that is not by coincidence. That is largely by design. We support markets so that the energy can flow back and forth. That is our greatest source of security. We have infrastructure, pipelines that come from Canada, multiple ports through which oil and product can enter the country, many ways it can cross back and forth. We don't lose everything if we lose one, one particular port or one particular pipeline. We can reroute and move. Infrastructure really is a tremendous source of, of security and also competition on price. We have strategic reserves. We support spare capacity in the world. We use our foreign policy as a tool to ensure that there are multiple supplies from multiple places. And we even support pipelines in other parts of the world because that diversity of supply is so key. <clears throat> but that is not a happenstance. That is a policy. And so we have to appreciate how important infrastructure is in particular and that diversity of, of supply to appreciate the role that Canada plays. And you've heard a lot this morning, so I won't go through the numbers, but as our number one supplier of oil and our number one supplier of gas and as a great source of clean electricity back and forth across the border, we export some to, uh, to Canada also, <clears throat> we have a tremendous amount of security which comes from the relationship with Canada, and that is, that is a, a fantastic thing. Um, we also have security from investment in technology, and I want to come to now President Obama's program. President Obama came to, to power, and like every other president, sought energy independence or autonomy, came appreciating that a U.S. foreign policy vulnerability is the importance of oil, not just to us, to other places around the world what happens to those regimes, what happens when supply comes off the market, the ability of oil to impact the global economy. And also, if you look at even right now, spare capacity shrinks, the margins are thin, 
Any country that has 300,000 barrels a day of production can get itself on the front page of the Financial Times by threatening to do this, that, or the other thing. You know, Ecuador is on there. Yemen is on the, is on the front lines. And that's because that ability to impact the market is huge. So we need the resilience. We need that diversity. So President Obama came to power saying, we're going to deal with this issue, but we're going to focus on demand. CAFE standards to change the transportation paradigm, investment in battery technology, advanced engines, biofuels. We're going to start, we're going to do, we're going to invest in these technologies. We're going to reduce U.S. dependence on oil for transportation. We're going to try and change the transportation paradigm. We're going to try and spread this in other places around the world. Also a key focus on climate, trying to get an agreement, trying to get cap and trade, trying to find ways to put an implicit price on carbon to favor other resources. And some of that policy worked really well, I think, in terms of the investment in technology. We're going to, the, the, the investment in CAFE standards is going to look absolutely visionary in three years as our, as our own demand flattens. And he put a bet on nuclear as well, offering loan guarantees that we basically weren't able to give away to support nuclear. So it was a diversified portfolio approach. And we used foreign policy indirectly to, to support supply. Now, supporting the elections in Nigeria is not to guarantee oil supply. But you don't, you're going to get an oil supply disruption if you don't have a decent election. Investing in Iraq to help them figure out export infrastructure and, and, and power and water is about oil supply, but it's also about stabilizing the, the country. And we did that um, even with our own programs, promoting a global shale gas initiative and, and, and capacity for future oil and gas producers. So there was an emphasis on supply, but the last six months have radically shifted the world. And part of that, I think, is, uh, you know, comes in, 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 in a couple of ways. One is, positively, demand is recovering, but that puts pressure on demand for oil. That's helping to drive up oil prices. The Arab Spring, which is potentially a tremendous source of voice and change in the Middle East, is also an incredible security challenge and threat. Because change in Egypt is different than change in Yemen and change in Bahrain. You know, the existential challenges for this administration are containing al-Qaeda, providing the, letting the economy revive, and climate change. But <clears throat> the threat which Yemen poses and Bahrain poses, the potential threat to, to Saudi Arabia, is huge. So you have this, this hard balance. And if nothing else, it, it creates instability and volatility in the oil markets. So you've got uncertainty pushing up oil prices, demand pushing up oil prices, tremendous uncertainty in terms of where, where supply comes from. And you have the Republicans taking the House. That's pretty much the end of the climate agreement. It's the end of funding for these technologies. And you have the other core of the Obama approach, which was to use regulatory policy, particularly hazardous emissions, regulation of hazardous emissions, to put an implicit price on carbon, which would shift power generation in the US away from coal and towards gas and towards renewables. Well, now, that which seemed like a relatively moderate agenda, and the gas industry thought it wasn't enough to create that change, well, now that's under attack also. And so you have a tremendous amount of uncertainty in, um, you know, in these markets. And so I think that's why you saw President Obama do a rebalancing or a pivot in his Georgetown speech um, uh, last week. And that was to say, we are going to sustain this clean energy agenda because it was the right thing to do, but we're going to rebalance on supply. We're going to embrace the juggernaut of unconventional oil supply in the U.S., in the Bakken, in the Niobra. We are going to embrace gas, shale gas, because that has huge potential for clean energy and we're going to make sure we do it safely and, and cleanly, but we're going to look at it for transportation in other areas. And we're going to recognize and say that diversity of supply from friendly neighbors like Canada and from Mexico and from Brazil and other places is critical because as much as we want to live in a world where we don't need oil, that is not the world we live in. And that is not the world that anybody else lives in. And it's that, this is going to be the case for decades to come. So the question is, how do we, how do we move this forward? And that's, where, and that's where Canada's role becomes so important. Canada is a huge supplier, multiple pipelines already. But you have this question of Keystone XL. Now, the Congress in its wisdom has required that the Department of State first evaluate the potential environmental impacts of permitting any cross-border pipeline, take notice and comment from anybody who wants to comment on it, answer every single question raised by every person and provide analysis for those answers and then determine what the impacts are. And then you take the following step, which is you make a determination whether it's in the national interest, considering those effects, to go forward with this, this pipeline. We have said yes to this many, many times before. But the issue raises a number, a number of questions. And on the environmental impact, you know, uh, well, let me do the national interest first. If you step away from the environmental impacts, 
this is the easiest case that you can make. We have a large source of supply, the largest outside OPEC, second largest in the world, next door, friendly. You have energy security from the supply. You have infrastructure security because it's from a pipeline, not from a port. You don't have weather issues or anything like that. A lot of that money gets recycled in the trade relationship, so money that we pay to suppliers, which are also U.S. companies that come to, to shareholders, probably gets recycled back into the, into the trade relationship. You have uh, the issue of the rents, which is if you have a choice of where you want to pay this money, would you rather pay it? To, 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 to a Nigeria where they may, may properly or not properly use those resources or pay it to Canada. You don't usually get a choice. This time we get a choice. So from a national security point of view, this is a no-brainer. But from an environmental impact statement point of view, it's not a no-brainer. And it's a complicated issue and it's a serious issue. It's frankly more serious for Canadians than it is for Americans, but it really bears some careful consideration. So we have this process, which has been, I know, an enormous source of frustration for the permit applicants. But as they always say when we, when we have this debate, it's you asked, because by requesting the permit, this process kicks into place. And so there are serious issues um, about how would the pipeline be routed? What's it like for the people who are going to have that in their backyards? What are the impacts of oil sands development on water, on air, on health, on wildlife? In our process, you put out a draft environmental impact statement and every agency in the U.S. government gets to grade it and comment on it, and so does everybody in the public. And so from this process, difficult as it may be, we learned a lot of things. First, the design of the pipeline changed and has improved. It is probably one of the safest pipelines that will be built anywhere, maybe safer than it needs to be, but TransCanada has, has very helpfully made 54 changes, I think, which were requested. The request which came out of the environmental impact statement, people living in the states where the pipeline is going to be saying, we'd like these changes. They accommodated. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. That helps. In terms of the environmental impacts, we also learned, with help from our Department of Energy, which was a skeptic, is a skeptic on, on the pipeline, the fundamental question, this is really the core question, whether a U.S. decision to permit this pipeline will be the direct and proximate cause of greenhouse gas emissions from the oil production process in Canada. If as a result of, of permitting the pipeline, we are responsible and if we say no, these emissions don't take place, that is a very different calculus and it comes out the other way. And the, the uh, implicit answer, sort of the instinctive answer, which a number of people gave is, of course Canada is going to produce this oil anyway. It will find its way to market by rail or by truck or by barge or by increased capacity in other pipelines. And yes, these refineries in the Gulf Coast, 8.3 million barrels a day of refining capacity going to 9.4 or something, they will find oil, but they might find it from Saudi heavy, or Mexico, or Venezuela, or someplace else. So the Department of Energy commissioned a study, and the conclusion of that independent study was, in fact, these emissions will take place whether or not we permit this pipeline. For me, that is a dispositive conclusion, and it will now go out for notice and comment in the supplemental environmental impact statement so people can have at it about what they think about the study. That is a big deal. That is a big deal, and it's, it was an instinctive answer, and now we know that that's the case. So I think in terms of framing the pipeline decision, that helps. But it's not the end of the story, because the reality is the aggregate impacts of oil sands development are significant, and no one would, I think no one would contest this. And you have, for, the, for those of you who are the uninitiated, you have the mining process, and that is obviously disruptive to land. It produces fine tailings. Birds can land in the ponds. You have reclamation but not restoration of the land. And then you have the so-called SAG-D or steam-assisted gravity process where you can have a much smaller footprint and you can steam the bitumen under the ground and it can flow back up through a variety of techniques. But you use a lot of gas to do that. So you've got the greenhouse gas emissions piece of it. So the question is really almost a moral one as responsible consumers. Have we paid enough attention to this issue to make sure that Canada is dealing with it? And I, I would say from, you know, I went to Canada uh, as many times as any place in the world, uh, including China, had a lot of discussions at the national level and the provincial level and the commercial level about how this issue is being dealt with. And there are a lot of really positive answers. Um, and, you know, the answers that we got at the provincial level is we are, we have directives, Directive 74 on fine tailings, which are going to require a lot of those to, you know, to be dry, maybe moving to dry stackable tailings in a number of years. There's still the legacy issues. That helps address the wildlife concerns. You have a regulator uh, in Alberta, um, which is, um, has a lot of people, a lot of inspections, is doing a lot of work 
to make sure that the process is done, is done properly. You have water management systems that are being done on the regional and national level to make sure you don't take too much water out of the Athabasca, that you don't have the tailings ponds too close to the river. And you have this huge investment in technology, which will, on some time frame, move to dry, to dry tailings. And, and reduce the need for these kinds of ponds. Find ways of shrinking the legacy ponds so that there's not as much water so you shrink them faster. Finding ways of using fewer greenhouse gas emissions in the extraction process so you deal with the, the greenhouse gas emissions process. And this, these deliberations you know, in the EIS have also made visible Canada's national plans about greenhouse gas emissions, which their Minister of Environment says will be a sectoral plan, a plan for transportation and a plan for electricity. Why do we care? Because the Obama administration and many members of Congress and many members of the U.S. public and probably many of you believe that the science or the risk of severe climate change is real, connected to man-made emissions. There can be skeptics, but do you want to take the chance? And do we, the United States, as an, or as an administration, undermine the ability to address the, the global green, green, greenhouse gas emissions process by permitting this pipeline? And if Canada has an answer, on how Canada will deal with its greenhouse gas emissions, then that answer is, is, is satisfactory. And if there are plans in place to the water and health and safety, then it's a Canadian problem, not an American problem, but we can feel comfortable that in fact there is a regulatory response and there's a commercial response. But as Ambassador Jacobs said, said this morning, things are happening, but more needs to be done. And this is where I think the next six months are critical because the pace of commercial investment in these fantastic technologies is good, on a share of R&D by industry, it's not that huge. Can something be done to hurry those technologies so that they come faster? There are remarkable things, downhole technologies that can heat the, heat the bitumen underground, bring it up, use less gas, but those are 10 years away. Can, is there a sign that can be, can be given about industry's willingness to, to, make a, to, to, to undertake a faster tempo on that? Uh, can, can all of the, the things that have come out of Alberta and the national government about dealing with water greater monitoring, be stated in a kind of compact so it's a commitment, after the election presumably, so that you can wrap together for those who don't really understand this issue, that there are steps being taken by Canadian authorities for Canadian reasons, for the Canadian people, but which are significant steps forward on water, on air, on greenhouse gas emissions, on health. If you can do those and you can inject that into the public debate, then you are gonna make people feel comfortable that the national interest is clear and the environmental impacts are significant and need to be dealt with, but Canada is on the case and because we are not causing these emissions, that Canada will deal with them. And that is the way you get to yes and that is a good answer for the social license to operate in Canada and it is a good answer for US-Canadian relationships and it can let us shift the agenda to the future and to, and to other things that we can work on and this is really natural gas where you have phenomenal reserves of gas in the U.S., phenomenal reserves in Canada, a tremendous amount of liquids which will, will, will basically things that, were, that make the cost of the dry gas relatively cheap compared to the other resources that come out of it. And this is creating a tremendous potential for the use of gas in, in other areas, in the U.S. for power generation and in Canada and elsewhere for transportation, although it's sort of a niche market, and also for export because there are lots of countries around the world, particularly in Asia, that still burn oil for power. And if you can create a more liquid gas market the way we have an oil market, and you can make the, the, the supply of gas available, and you can change the use of coal or oil for power generation in Asia, then you're on that greenhouse gas emission agenda. And you're not doing it by a dictate or by a cap, you're doing it because you are making the commercial basis for power generation favor gas over coal and favor gas over oil, and that is a more sustainable way forward. I think there, we can talk about what the challenges are to, to moving the gas market in, in that direction, because I think they're significant, but for a long time, the U.S.-Canada energy dialogue, the clean energy dialogue, the bilateral dialogue, has been on demand and has been on technology. But the big rocks in this world, where supply is uncertain, the economy is uncertain, the politics are uncertain, and the future of the, the greenhouse gas emissions agenda is uncertain, is talking about the big rocks, and those are oil and gas, as well as demand. And there is a lot that we can do, there is a lot that we can do to harmonize this, and I think the, in the end, you know, I, I think as, as Dean Shepard said, on the gas side, the real changes are going to be commercial, not policy, because the, the odds of legislation in the U.S. the next two years are, are pretty weak. 
changing commercial arrangements and sharing risk on natural gas can change the gas market. It can create an export market. It can create these opportunities. So I think it's going to take this interdisciplinary approach at the government level. It's going to take some government-government dialogue. It's going to take uh, some commercial arrangements. It's going to take talk between our industries and your industries. And it's going to take a great deal of communication, communication by industry, communication by governments, that this is the world we're living in. We've got to be realistic and literate about the energy world we face. But if we talk about those issues, we can move this agenda forward, not by solely focusing on the world that we want to live in, but focusing on the one that we have right now. And in that dialogue, and in that conversation, and in that relationship, we are, as Americans, really lucky to have Canada as a partner. Because there are not very many countries in the world where you get to live next door to a huge supply of oil, gas, electricity, and, a, and, and from a country that is also your partner in peace, your partner in war, your partner in business, and has the same values that, that, that we do. It is a tremendous, and I would say for our Canadian friends, deeply underappreciated source of American security. But there's nothing like the world we're living in right now to make people realize what that is. So uh, I thank you for your attention, and for our Canadian friends, we're really glad you're there. Thank you. Well. My name is Kirsten. I'm a joint degree between the Nicholas School of the Environment and the Fuqua School of Business. Um, I had a couple questions about some of the global initiatives that you've been part of, the ECGI, I believe it is, and um, what so sort of motives beyond Canada we have in aligning ourselves um, with international energy policies. And um, yeah, that's Great. it. Great. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, I had uh, two programs that I, I started at the, uh, at the State Department. My job at the State Department, I was the Special Envoy for International Energy Affairs, but there were lots of people worrying about demand in the Obama administration, so I was kind of the guy that worried about supply. Uh, and so I saw two, two ways to significantly increase global energy security. One was um, looking at the oil and gas producers of the future. This is this energy governance and capacity initiative. Because having done a lot of work on, on oil sector transparency, it seemed that most of the bottom-up approaches to try and get governments to use their resources wisely and manage the money well didn't work. You, start, you had to have leadership at the top of those governments to want to reform to be effective. So um, my thought was if we were able to help train the treasuries and finance ministries of these countries how to manage the money before they got the money, and if we trained them how to do their geologists and their petroleum ministries how to do seismic interpretation, how to understand the resource, how to run, run the business, how to have auction systems and competitive systems, we could teach them how they could make money, how they could attract investment, how they could be politically more popular in their own countries because they would have systems that would not imply that they had their hand in the till. And in a, by building their capacity early on, by having our U.S. Geological Survey talk to theirs, our Treasury Department talk to their finance ministries, you create these long-term government-to-government relationships. And the big producers of the next generation, Uganda, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Papua New Guinea, Timor, Timor Mozambique, possibly even the Seychelles, I and mean, these are tremendous sources of oil and gas, which will have huge impacts on the market if you get to them early. So that was one. The other was a global shale gas initiative. Um, when I first got to the department, I kind of had to do intro to shale gas for the State Department, because foreign policy people don't think about, about shale gas too much. But it was clear, uh, first in China, then in India, and then we globalized it, that there were these tremendous shale uh, resources around the world. But the ability to bring those to market really depends on whether countries have the fiscal systems to invite investment, whether they have transportation systems that will allow gas to move from the place where it's produced to a market, whether they have a gas price that will incentivize anybody to invest in there? And then do they have the capacity to regulate to make sure they can manage the water and drilling safety and cementing and casing and all the basics? Because even for the US, you know, states that have a history of this are pretty good at it, but they are being taxed by the volume of production. Governments that don't have regulators could end up in a world of trouble. So the, the idea was to bring the 13 agencies and industry and state regulators to meet with these other countries to teach them how to, how to do it. And so we started by doing resource assessments, sending our geologists to China and India in particular to basically do an assessment of their potential posted on the web to buy down the investment cost for companies and then teach their geologists how to do it themselves. 
but the other is, is intro, to, intro to regulation. And so we thought we'd get a little bit of interest. We had 23 countries show up last August and, uh, and, then, uh, and then lots more who, who couldn't make it. So it's a way of leveraging government to government cooperation, but that's an area where there's not a lot of money for it anymore. <laughs> and it's really gonna be incumbent on industry to make sure that their partners overseas do it right. But where I spent most of my time, so thank you for the question, Chris. I don't think it's a threat, but it went from zero to nine billion last year, so it's uh, it's certainly significant. Um, I think um, part of that is uh, you know is is Chinese and, and Korean companies trying to learn the business, uh, particularly those that are investing in in shale and unconventional. Some of it is about making money, but I'm I'm certain for uh, for China at least, it's the hope of getting exports to those markets. I mean, I said as a U.S. policymaker before, and I would I would say it now that that foreign investment in Canada is not a threat to the United States. Exports of gas from Canada make eminently good sense, and for the U.S. as well, um, although there are challenges there. And exports of oil make sense for Canada. Um, I'm not sure the economics work, that the net back for those companies to go west is going is to really make it worthwhile. But I think that's not a threat. What would be a threat is if the Canadian government, like some other governments, entered into long-term supply contracts that would reduce the liquidity of the market overall, because that market system is where we all get our security. That, I think, would get a reaction. Anything else, I think, is fair business and, and fair game. And if, if the XL pipeline doesn't go forward, do you think Canada's alternative might be to do those con kind of long-tender contracts? Well, I think the, 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 first, I think the first thing that will happen if XL weren't permitted is that, um, because it'll take a while for that production to, to ramp up, um, I think you'd have, uh, you'd have plans to move it by rail and barge and other, other sources. I think you would have maybe ways to increase the efficiency of the existing pipelines, which are not yet at, at capacity. Um, and then you might have more interest in Canada in, in various Western routes. Um, Canada has the same issues that the U.S. has in terms of you know, whether people want that pipeline going through there, whether they want a harbor dug deeper than it is in particular places, but I think it'd be a, a powerful market signal. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.